Hey guys, Nancy here with T-Cell Logic. So, I hope you guys are doing well. I'm doing pretty well. It's raining today. But other than that, everything's been pretty good. Today we have my co-host Jasmine here today, who is dressed up just for the occasion. Today's case comes from Manchester, New Hampshire, or New Hampshire. Okay, so Laureen lived with her mother Judy Ron on the third floor of a building at Merrimack Street in Manchester, New Hampshire, and she attended Parkside Junior High School and had good grades. Her mother, Judith Ron, was out of town on this day with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend at the time was a professional tennis player, so they had gone out to enjoy some tennis matches. And Laureen would usually go along with them, but she was on spring break during this time and wanted to stay home and hang out with some friends. So she asked her mother to stay home. Her mom said, well, you know, that's fine. You can stay home. So she stayed home. So that evening, Laureen had two friends over. One was a male, one was a female. The three were drinking beer and wine on this night. And later in the evening, the male friend thought he had heard some commotion out in the hallway and thought that maybe Lauren's mom had returned from the tennis match earlier than anticipated, so he figured he would leave. He ended up leaving, but he left out the back door because he didn't want to be seen by Lauren's mom. I don't know if maybe he wasn't allowed to be there. This male friend states that when he left through the back door of the apartment, he heard Lauren lock the door right behind him. And this is important because later in the story, we'll talk about why it is important. When the male friend left, it wasn't actually her mother arriving. Judas, her mother, did not actually return till about 1.15 a.m. on that April 27th. When she entered the building, she went to check on Laureen in her bedroom and she noticed the outline of a person in her bed. So she figured that it was Laureen laying in bed. She didn't really think much of it. She went to bed and it wasn't until the next morning that she realized that it was not Laureen in the bed, but it was actually her female friend. And this friend said that Laureen had slept out in the living room on the couch. When Judith entered the apartment building, she did notice that the three lights in the hallway to go up the stairs to her third floor apartment were all unscrewed. She didn't really think anything of it, but I mean, she noticed that they had been unscrewed. It was dark in the hallways and it was only on three floors. Only the three that she would have to go up to get to her apartment. When Judith started looking around the apartment, she noticed that Lorraine's shoes were out in the living room. Judith found her clothes in the living room and the back door was open. The pillow and the blanket that Lauren had used were also on the couch out in the living room, so those were accounted for. Judith ended up calling the police at 3.45 p.m. the next day to report Lauren missing. Police initially thought that Lauren had run away and later police changed their mind and decided that this was not a runaway, but it was actually a disappearance. Police believe that Lorraine did leave the apartment on her own accordance, but with the intention of coming back in quickly after. They suspect that Lorraine met with foul play while outside. In October of 1980, Judith noticed that her phone bill was a lot more than it usually is. She had been charged for three calls placed in California. And Judith did not have any friends in California. She had absolutely no ties in California. So she found this to be very strange. She did not know of Lorraine having any ties to California. She definitely wanted to look into this and see why she was getting charged for calls made from California. Back in the 1980s, what you could do is you could bill the calls you made from somewhere else, not in your house, to your bill that you would get at your home. So it'd be kind of like calling collect, except you'd be making these calls from a different place and then them getting billed to your account. One of the calls that was made from these motels to the teen sexual assistance hotline was actually traced back to an unnamed physician who was maintaining this hotline. 
they ended up catching up with this physician and, you know, asking some questions about his hotline. Physician indicated that he knew nothing of the phone call that was made from that motel. Five years later, though, he changed his story and said that a friend of his wife named Annie Sprinkle, who was a porn actress back in the day, might know something about Laureen or about other girls that may have run away or have gone missing. But police were unable to link, you know, Laureen's disappearance with Annie Sprinkle or any other missing girls. And also the doctor mentioned that some of these girls would come and visit his wife and that he may have seen someone who looked like Laureen or possibly was Laureen at one point in time. They were also unable to link his wife to, to Laureen's disappearance or any other missing young girls. So in 1981, Judith started receiving calls from a mysterious person and the calls would usually come in at about 3 45 a.m and they increased in frequency around christmas time so the caller would never say anything when they called mostly it was laureen's sister who was answering these calls and she noticed that the caller would stay silent before terminating the call they didn't come in every day, but they would certainly get a number of them, enough to notice that there was someone calling and not saying anything, and then just hanging out for some reason. So Judith ended up changing her phone number so that these calls would stop, and I don't blame her. I mean, who wants to be getting calls at, at 3.45 a.m. where it's just, you know, hanging out on the other end, breathing you know, for who knows what reason. And of course, with her changing her phone number, those calls stopped. There's no reports of her getting any more calls after she changed her phone number, to her new number, that is. So after some time, in 1986, Judith decided to hire a private investigator to travel to California on her behalf to find out where these calls had come from and see if he could get any information as to who may have made them. So the private investigator ended up locating the motels that the calls had been placed from. So apparently one of these motels was used by a Dr. Z who had connections to the porn industry, may have had connections to the child industry. Another curious fact about this case is that the same year that Judith had hired this private investigator, one of Laureen's childhood friends named Roger Morris, I believe I'm saying that right, Morris, Roger Morris or Roger Morris. So he claimed that his mother had answered a phone call one afternoon and that the caller on the other end said that their name was Lori or Laureen, and that the woman said that she was one of Roger's ex-girlfriends. The call ended right about there, and the caller hasn't been heard from since and has never been identified. Investigators aren't sure if it was Laureen on the other end of that call. So Judith, Laureen's mom believes that her acquaintances know more than they're letting on to, and she hopes that one day they come out and just say everything there is to know about what happened to Lorraine on that <coughs> night. So investigators believe that foul play was involved in her case, which continues to be unsolved to this day. Also, one interesting thing that I wanted to add that according to police doesn't really have anything to do with Lorraine's disappearance but it's just a curious fact is that her male friend actually ended up committing suicide in 1985 and they don't believe that it had anything to do with this case he was never considered a suspect but it is very curious that he would end up committing suicide in 1985. No one knows why he took his own life so now let's get into the sightings there have been a couple sightings or people who think they may have seen Lorraine um, and one of them was a family member from Boston Massachusetts 
They claim to have actually seen Lorraine in Boston and this sighting took place about a year after Lorraine had gone missing. The sighting remains unconfirmed. They don't know if it was her. There's a possibility. The family member is pretty sure it was her, but that's all there is to it. Another sighting came from a witness in Anchorage, Alaska. The only reason they think so is because they ended up seeing a picture of Laureen, one of the pictures that was distributed when she had gone missing. And it was from that picture that they were almost sure that they had seen her. This unconfirmed sighting apparently took place in 1988. And it's not very reliable because this witness that their recollection comes from way back when in 1980. The woman was not believed to have been Laureen because of the time lapse. Judith ended up moving to Florida and getting remarried. She believes that her daughter was the one who placed those three phone calls in California. I could see why she would think that because of the way that those calls would have had to have been made. In order for them to be billed to her landline account, someone would have needed to call this phone number and know the PIN that would be necessary to have those calls billed to her account. So in that sense, I can see why she would think it was Laureen who made those calls. Or it might have been just a really crazy freak coincidence that someone would have been putting in their pin and mistakenly put in her pin instead. I, I mean that's such a crazy coincidence but those things happen so you never know. I think it might have been Laureen making those calls from California and I wish there was more information about this case to give me a better idea of what Laureen was like you know, who her friends were. You can't even find the names of the friends that were hanging out with her that night anywhere online. Then there's uh, the male friend ended up committing suicide in 1985. And it's just so crazy. The whole thing is just so crazy. I wish there, again, I wish there was more information about this case. Um, I did kind of scour the internet to see if I could find any more tidbits of information that most of the articles I found did not include. Um, I wasn't able to. Also, I wonder why Laureen decided to go outside after her male friend had left. She didn't take anything with her. She didn't take her purse. She didn't take her shoes. So she just very, the speculations, you know, it's speculated that she very quickly stepped outside with every intention of coming back. But in that very short period of time, she may have met with foul play or maybe she was out there talking to someone that she knew and felt comfortable with and they had something to do with it. And it brings me back to the male friend who committed suicide in 18, 1985, in 1985. I wonder why he committed suicide. I wonder if he knows more about this than they talked about. But you know, we, we don't really know. There's just not too much information on this case, and I wish there was. But what I will leave you with is a description of Laureen. Um, she's five foot four and 90 pounds, very tiny girl. She was last seen wearing a white V-neck sweater, a blue plaid blouse, brown shoes, and a heart-shaped gold ring, and a silver-blue necklace. Lorraine had brown hair, blue eyes, and a prominent scar on her upper leg. Alright guys, that does it for today. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful day, and stay safe. Peace out.